comedian Rock Cocaine. Joining us now, please join me in welcoming noted Seattle defense attorney Mark Mustel. Mark. What, uh, what, what do you think of what's been said so far here? I thought I was most impressed by the woman who stressed the fact that what you have to deal with is the education of the people who are going out ripping off TVs, VCRs, stereos to buy crack. <clears throat> I think unlike a number of drugs which traditionally have been abused, that this one has the highest potential to hurt people immediately. And you can lock them up, you can arrest them. The criminal justice system isn't designed to deal with the number of people who are abusing drugs. You cannot get all those people through the little funnel into court and then into any type of jail. You have to cause them to realize that they're destroying themselves so they won't do it. Do, do you think police in general, not just Sergeant Pellin, are, are they handling this in a manner that you would feel comfortable with? Well, you really, I can't generalize. In my practice, I represent a number of people who are arrested by different police agencies. Some are arrested uh, because they got caught legitimately doing something wrong. Others are arrested when the police have bent the rules. I think any time the police can capture a criminal following the law, that's exactly what they're paid to do and what they should be doing. Any time they bend the law to catch somebody else who's bending the law, then it's wrong. Well, about the victims, the users, how can we get them to stop as a community? How can we, you know, pull together and get them? Because it's hurting them just as much as, you know, us. It's hurting them more than anyone. Well, I think programs like this is the first step. The media has perhaps the most power in the country, and they broadcast the message. Yes, well, as citizens, we have to take a strong stand, and there is a petition out now. It's Initiative 94. It's Citizens Against Drug Dealers. Mandatory five-year prison terms, no plea bargaining, and drug dealers pay for their own incarceration. You know, Ken, I think that you have to watch a certain amount of hysteria in dealing with people involved with drugs. A five-year mandatory term is more than you get for second-degree manslaughter in this state. It's more than you get for first-degree manslaughter, which is killing somebody. So you uh, would argue against, let, let's take this item by item, you'd argue against the five-year mandatory sentence for first offenders then? I'd argue against any mandatory type law that doesn't take in the differences of the people who are being treated into account. Okay, what about the uh, paying for their own incarceration? Uh, and if they don't pay, what do you do? Do you just okay. keep them forever? What about, what about no plea bargaining? There's always going to be plea bargaining, because as I explained, if you arrest a thousand people, there's only room for a hundred of them to go to trial. And what are you going to do with the rest of the people? When they, start in, uh, when they start not plea bargaining with me after a case is charged, we, pl pre we plea bargain before the case is charged. There are people who get caught up into circumstances that have different situations than other people. And the prosecutor and the police normally deal with those people differently. Okay, Ken, let's... let me just comment on that because Harry Connick is a district attorney in New Orleans and a very well-respected DA. He took the position on drug cases, no plea bargaining. When the police come in with a charge, we're going to go with that charge. Their drug statistics, their overdose deaths, their emergency rooms, the availability of drugs were reduced because the traffickers and the dealers knew they were going to do hard time if they got caught and they're arrested and they were put actually in a, in a guilty plea. So the sense of a certainty of punishment, I don't know whether the five years, the four years, the eight years, I'm less concerned with the severity of punishment than the certainty. But okay. that is key. Let's, uh, I think, hold on one sec, Chuck. Let's, we, we want to get to the phones here real quickly. Go ahead, you're on town meeting. Hello, Ken Trail. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. This is Mrs. Keys. I'm talking to Sergeant Pillum. I live in the uh, neighborhood where he works in the South End. I have about 11 incident numbers of where my stepson has come in and stolen my VCR, which they found two blocks from my house. He knows who I am and stolen everything that I have. And now I'm out of... Uh, They've gotten me out of here, but I am very angry. Sergeant well, Pillow who, who forgot to mention... Angry, who are you angry with? Pardon me? Who are you angry with? I am angry with them pulling, stopping Sergeant Pillow them from doing the work that he was doing in this neighborhood of getting...
getting rid of these bills that they have in this neighborhood. As he know I live in a building where they got two okay. apartments that are dealing. All right, hold on, a, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Sergeant, if I understand her correctly, she's saying that she's angry with police officials, your bosses, I guess, who, who are hampering you from, from doing the job that she thinks you should be able to do. I think she expresses what is a growing sense that there is a hell of a lot of conflict in the police industry as to what we are going to do on the streets of America, going to the notion of certainty of punishment, going to the notion that the joints, let me make a point, the joints in this state are full of people and the streets are full of crime. Write it down. You've got a $70 million jail in the heart of this town. They're already sleeping in the quarters. We are feeding them the cannon fodder off these street corners. I asked a kid just out of the joint the other day, how many 10-pound dope dealers did you see in there? He didn't remember any. So it goes to what the police will do, That's right. how aggressively, and whom they will target. And for too long in this town, it's simply been acceptable to grind up the cannon fodder. A lot of stats, a lot of arrests. And the problem has gotten worse in the interim. And he's in jail, and they're fixing to let him out. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if we have any answer for her right now. Uh, one issue that we haven't addressed is drug rehabilitation. Right on. I have a very close friend who has a severe problem with uh, crack addiction. I have a sister who's a user. Um, the friend went in for inpatient treatment for a month, was right back out on the street a day later using the drug again. I think that uh, there are some serious concerns. I think we should get the state legislation to come in on this. Um, instead of these people sitting around in meetings for five or six hours a day, they need to be doing other things, other activities, getting back to uh, the normal activities that they did before they... But see, we're still trying to figure out how to get them off the street. I mean, rehabilitation, and no one is taking away from rehabilitation. But one of the things that we're starting trying to deal with here to begin with is how to take them, remove them as a threat away from the people who are non-addictors. But one way, because uh, having run a prison system myself in Illinois for four years, the recidivism rate for drug people is very, very high, 90%. Drugs are not a self-curing disease. You need intervention. You need rehabilitation. Somebody that has done drugs needs to get real close supervision from friends that love them, that care about them, drug testing, to make sure they're going straight and getting off that habit. So you need that intervention to protect the community and to protect that individual from him or herself. I'd just like to say, I think it kind of amazes me how much the Reagans put so much into these advertisements they have for stop drugs, but yet Mr. Reagan's so willing to put all these billions of dollars into a contraption to space that I've never seen. I don't even know what it does. I don't even care what the Soviet Union's doing. I care about what's going on in this country right now. Sergeant, is it, is it a matter of money? I mean, are we talking just throwing more dollars at this problem? Is that? I think some money can very realistically be spent some of you have lived in Seattle for a long lot of years, and you may remember that 10 or 12 years ago in this town, we had 150 more cops so that there was more effective response, and there would be a component of bodies available, let's say, for our program now. Well, why have we got, let's, let's go with this one item at a time. Why do we have 100 and fewer, 150 fewer police officers today? Well, cops cost you more all the time, and one of the ways to pay the people that you have more is to buy fewer as people retire and leave this so service. it's it's a money saving exact factor okay if we had more cops does it just go without saying that this problem would be being handled better no no it still goes to the same point strategies you've got to use the cops you've got the sad fact of the matter is we could do more with what we have now although we need more police officers in this town all right we're going to take a break when we come back we will talk about we've addressed this touched lightly on it what do you do if there is a rock house operating in your neighborhood? Or what will be done about it? We will talk about that when we come back. Please go to the third floor. Take it. Take it. Again. 